Does this work? Or are we on? No. Right. So I'm not going to give you any advice on how to work with your companies. I'm simply going to tell you a bit about how we work with Paradox. We started out, I took over a six-man strong studio in 2004, and today we're 105 people at the Stockholm, New York, and the Kravde offices, and another 150 people throughout the world who make games for us on an exclusive basis. And it's been great leading the company during this time. It's been a lot of different challenges. It's been a lot of different things, but one thing has kept us together all the time and is that we try to find an unfulfilled niche of a game. We never try to compete with the big guys like Ubisoft that you just saw. You will never see a CGI trailer like that from Paradox, because that probably costs more than our most expensive game this year. So, I was like a kid on Christmas Eve when I discovered Prezi last night, so I apologize for all the bad clip art that is in my presentation. I put it together myself. So who are Paradox Interactive? Uh, I asked some people before coming here, I asked on Twitter, my Twitter followers. Maybe I have a few in the audience. I hope so. Otherwise, I'm the Wester front on Twitter. And uh, I asked, what is Paradox to you guys? What do we represent? And people replied a lot of different things. Like nerdy is a good word for Paradox Interactive. We make nerdy stuff. We're the masters of strategy gaming. That's a very good one. We're crazy, which I kind of like. I think it's positive. I'm not really sure. But I think that it nails it that we do the unexpected. At least at times we do. We do have sequels. We do do some of the same stuff over and over again. But we want to do sometimes the unexpected. <coughs> Another part of it discussed the business part of Paradox. Uh, I got some replies that were, you're a fast-growing company. You can see it. There's a lot of pace in the company. You're a very transparent company because I always reply to anyone who uh, approaches me on Twitter with a question or by email, I always reply back, hopefully within a few hours, you know, if I'm not traveling, which I unfortunately do a lot. We're professional, which is the first time I've heard that in my 10 years of running this company, and it feels really good to reach the level when people actually call you professional. Maybe that is something to look out for. I don't know, maybe that kills the creativity. Speaking of which, actually, I have a lot of companies out there, I know you have chief creative officers or creative directors. We actually don't have that at Paradox. I banned the word creative from titles. I said we should be an adjective-free environment, meaning that all the hundred and plus people who work for me are supposed to be creative, not one or five people, maybe with the exception for people in finance. <laughs> not too much creativity there that can cause a lot of trouble for everyone. Someone even said we were nice. I don't know how to interpret that either, but I wanted to bring it up there. We tried to be a nice company. David was into that as well, like being nice, being a hero. That is a really good, I'm going to use that. I'm going to start using that as well and claim it as my own. You're my only witnesses in here, right? So if you throw in a few of our brands in there, you see the Magica Wizard there to the right, if it's to the right for you as well. War the Roses in the middle. And if it's Europa Universalis, I know it's a bit hard to pronounce. So I, don't, I don't blame you for that. That's basically Paradox Interactive. But what is a niche? If you speak about market niche, what are you after? Well, according to Wikipedia, where I looked it up, it is a subset of the market on which a specific product is focusing on, is focusing on that specifies, first of all, the needs and demands of this niche. What we ask ourselves when we do new games is that, is this game a sequel or, or does it go to a mature market? Because it sets certain expectations on the game and on the budget, obviously. Is it a new game or genre that we're creating? Or the new, a new game in a known genre? Because that is a, a little more risk. Is it a complementing genre? Or is it an emerging trend that we're jumping on? These are very good to define to yourself. Like, what do we think that our game is on the market? And then, Check it with someone else externally in the company. What do you think of this concept before you bring it to market? Because it can mean a lot of different things. Jumping on an emerging trend, I mean, trying to take advantage of a technology shift, for example, 
the technology shifts are few and far in between, even if we're a fast-moving industry. So just jumping over to the new technology might be a big risk, might also be a big gain. We'll look at companies like Mojang, we'll look at Rovio, for example, who took a lot of advantage of the new, uh, new technology. You look at the price range, Premium and freemium is a very broad definition, though. Premium could be anything from the $60, $70 titles that AAA developers are making. But it could also be a $9 or $10 game on Steam. I don't know how much Sur Surgeon Simulator was. I guess it was $10 or equivalent, yeah. And we do a lot of $10 games as well. And we're experimenting with freemium, but there is also a, an in-between. that You can do premium, you can put some... Uh, you can put a price on it and then sell in-game items. The most important thing with a niche is that you shouldn't leave money on the table. A lot of people are still willing to pay good money to actually get access to play the game because you serve a niche where you're pretty much alone in the market. Europa Universalis is one of those niches. Like People ask me, why don't you add tactical battles like Total War does? Well, it's because their titles probably cost 10 times what our titles do, and instead of adding that, we add even more complex, dip, complex diplomatic relations or war scores or whatever that makes it a deeper experience. I read a, tr a thread in a forum saying like, the day you think that civilization isn't complex enough, play Europa Universalis. That's what I like to read. I'm like, perfect, I like it. That also means that we have a place in the market. So uh, another thing that you t have to take into consideration is the production quality because you need to focus on the certain things that will speak to your audience within the niche. Not everything needs to be perfect, but the exact thing that you deliver to the target audience needs to be per perfect. If it's a war game, the war part of it needs to be perfect. While the map can look well so-so and the UI doesn't, doesn't have to be the most polished either. If you make a game for kids that is very niche, maybe the UI is the most important thing. So the production quality, seeing like, okay, we have limited resources here because most studios do. Most of you guys in here don't have the 270 employees, which five can work on a UI, right? So you have to make these balancing uh, acts every day. So what part is most important in our production quality? We talk about that every day. And the demographics, obviously. What's the demographic of Europa Universalis for? It's a man, 25 to 45, with an academic degree, mostly in historical or military-oriented topics. I had this discussion with a marketing expert. I'm always, always very uh, skeptical towards anyone who's an expert in marketing, because nowadays everything is so easy to actually see if it works or not, so it's harder to be an expert, I guess. And she said, how many women play your games? And I said, 10% roughly play Europa Universalis, so the total audience. And then she says, well, then there's a huge untapped female market for Europa Universalis. And I said, it's the exact opposite. There's a huge untapped male audience, because we still haven't reached all the males out there. Starting like looking for more females in that audience is not the way to go. Look for the same people over and over again the twin of the people who are playing your games now are the ones who are going to play it going forward, right? That's how you find a new target audience. The advantages of being in the niche, because being in a niche can be pretty tricky. The budgets are lower, the pressure can be pretty high from the audience because they expect a lot of different things that we can't deliver on the budget or time. It's easier to identify your customer. Like, if you make a World War II game that is very in-depth and very nerdy, like our Hearts of Iron, we start looking for them on World War II forums. Makes sense, right? In America, they have something called World War II Monthly Magazine, even. Great magazine, 120 pages every month. Like, that's like a treasure of untapped audience for Hearts of Iron, right? When we reach all of them, we can start looking at the women audience as well, because I don't think there are too many women unfortunately reading that magazine. But it's easier to identify where they are, who they are, and what they like, because we already niched ourselves on the game. Oh, here comes the, uh, the terrible clip art. It's also easier to communicate with those customers, since you know where they are. It's also easy to use modern, uh, modern communications like Facebook. If you tried Facebook ads, for example, it's very easy to 
to target your ads and audiences. You can even have World War II as a specific interest and target your ads towards that audience. It's fantastic. So not only Zynga or King.com can use Facebook as a major tool to be successful. You can build your audience in channels where you didn't think you would find them. Because Facebook has over a billion registered users today. Almost everyone has a Facebook account. You can be more efficient in your marketing spend by this. Since you know where they are, you know how to communicate, you can only direct the money towards where the audience actually is. And you can, on a daily basis, adjust your marketing budget, seeing like this works, works this doesn't work, uh, and see like, okay, how am I building this audience up? And you form a relationship with your gamers. Like, even if you have over 200 people in your studio, you still have five million gamers. And collectively, those gamers know more about your game than you do. We learn things about our games every day from our gamers. We learn new functionalities, we learn how to mod the game, we learn a lot. Because we gather everything on our Paradox forums where people can speak freely about the games and what they think and start new modding, to, to, uh, modding threads and whatnots. And we learn every day on what they're doing. Up to 30% today buys Europa Universalis 3 to play a mod. And that's a six-year-old game and we still sell a lot of units. And that's all due to an active community. So, the formula, how have we put this together? Like, I'm gonna take some things I've already said, but we focus a lot on replayability. This is a very broad definition. Like, what is really replayability? It's when someone played your game for 30 minutes, why should it then they play it for another 30 minutes? And when they played the full hour, why should they play it for another 10 hours? That is replayability. So, Europa Universalis has the sandbox mode that you can choose from whatever country you want in the world in the Renaissance period. Perfect replayability. But we can even make it better if we want to. Achievements, Easter eggs, modability, whatnot. We discuss this topic every day. It's the single most important aspect that we discuss in gaming today, is the replayability thing. And Another bonus with the replayability is that it increases the probability that someone will buy a DLC for your game, which is always good, because then you can continue to make great things for the same game and increase the life cycle for that game. Our most popular game, I can't name it, unfortunately, but on the sample audience of 300,000 people, I think is in our sample audience, we have over 70 hours on average who play the game, on average. Imagine if they used it to save the world instead. Think about that for a while. <laughs> then you get a bad conscience and you want to go work for the Red Cross. At least I feel that way. So I stopped reading our average play numbers now. Important. High engagement factor. I was into that a bit before. Uh, like, why didn't we add the tactical battles from Total War? No, instead we're nerding out, as we call it in the office. Nerding out means instead of adding big flashy things, we add things that only total nerds care about. <laughs> like, uh, what brigade attachment can you have on an infantry division in a World War II game? That kind of stuff. But then you get like five page emails telling you that you're an imbecile because you made some mistakes like, it was February 43, not January, you moron, stuff like that. Fantastic, best fans ever. I always reply and say, you're great, here's a free game. <laughs> they help us nerd out even more, super important. Emergent gameplay is kind of a buzzword, so I'm gonna skip, like, uh, I'm gonna go through it very quickly. But emergent gameplay to me is what's happening inside your head instead of what's happening on the screen. As a niche player, you can never compete with the CGI trailers or the graphics of the big guys. Therefore, the immersion of the game and what goes on in here must be much better than, than most of the AAA titles. My favorite example, unfortunately we didn't publish that game, is uh, Faster Than Light. How many here played that game? Oh yeah, great game, great. If you haven't played it, go play it now. That has great emergent gameplay. Super simple graphics, but you imagine every, everything happening on screen. Like, okay, you're running this spaceship, and 
fantastic. I'm not going to spoil it to you. So just go and play it. And dare to differ. Don't try to emulate what other people do necessarily because that means you will compete with the budget and not with creativity. You can imagine, you, you can make me imagine that a lot of the big budget trailers are also based on creativity, but they're also based on the fact that in this market, you need to show off explosions to a very big extent, right? And the bigger and the bolder the explosions are, the more people are going to buy your game. But we can't compete in that space, so we need to be different. We released, two weeks ago, we started pre-order for a game called Leviathan Warships. Anyone knows about it? Yeah? So we released a trailer. Uh, that we call the Jazzy Boat Trailer. Anyone seen that? Yeah. yeah. And uh, the bud total budget for both trailers was $2,000. And we got 500,000 views in three days. Because we did something that was the complete opposite of what everyone else was doing. It wasn't particularly funny. It was mostly a lot of bo boat puns, like ship just got real. That's not very funny. But when you see it in a trailer, it's kind of unexpected that you're going to bump into that, right? So we had jazzy music in the background and a slow voice commenting what was happening on the screen. Totally boring. It sounds totally boring. And people were like emailing me, this is the best thing that ever happened. So it was kind of unexpected. This happens maybe one out of every 10 times we try to be funny. But once it happens, it's like striking the jackpot. It has an enormous effect. So it, it went from being totally unknown to mankind to being super popular and reaching top 10 in the, uh, on uh, iOS. And that's what we call anti-marketing. Um, instead of copying what people are doing on the marketing side and just trying to take the, uh, the concepts from other people, we're trying to do anti-marketing at times. Like Europa Universalis 3, when we released that, we said, instead of saying, the best strategy game ever, like, it will blow your mind. We said, maybe, like, maybe this game is not for you. Then people were like, what? <laughs> really? Like, I need to try that. Like, it's a bit hard. Maybe you should think twice. You know, maybe you should play something else. We're just saying this. We're just concerned about you gamers. So people were really intrigued by that approach. They were like, this is so crazy. I have to try this game. So it's like a challenge to that niche. People who feel smart, we're telling them that, well, maybe you can't really do this. Anti-marketing. And from all these five elements, you get the niche formula. That's basically how we work on um, putting together the whole. Oh, that looked pretty good, actually, when you put it together like that. <laughs> but on the development side, what can you do there to actually minimize your risk, still getting the max out of your budgets? You were into that with game jams, really good way to go. Uh, and start out with a lot of different experimenting, testing, seeing is this fun, is this not fun, and be very critical towards yourself. We do it all the time. Have a very solid post-release plan so you don't go all in on the exact release. Because going all in on only the release means that you have no money left for marketing and not much money to develop the game if it doesn't go as well as you initially thought. You can actually help a game after release. A game that is solid in the foundation can still sell a lot of units, even though it doesn't start out that well. We've done that with quite a few titles, actually. It started very slow, and then after three to six months, we're starting to get traction because we patched the game, we added extra content, we started to market it again, some new people found it and t told their friends, et cetera, et cetera. And iterating on the formulas as well. We say to people, don't waste your XP. <laughs> so if you have a working engine, you have a working concept, continue to iterate on that. The studio that we have that develops Europa Universalis 4, they have iterated on the engine and on the formula for almost 14 years at the moment. And that's a lot of experience. If anyone else is coming into our niche nerd territory, it's going to cost them a lot of money and take them a lot of time. So we, we have sort, sort of a safe zone there where we do what we actually know, when we're not experimenting and being stupid. I don't know why, why I put a Nintendo console there. It just felt right. <laughs> so what kind of hardware are we working with on the niche development? It's still it's a pressure. We know that. It's a budget pressure. It's pressure from the gamers, from the different audiences around us. And the traditional is PC versus console. 
what do we choose? And we always, cho we always choose what we call the open platforms, which means that it's simple, uh, the development is fairly free, and you can do basically whatever you want without someone else interfering. So we've been focusing on PC, Windows, Linux, Mac, and now lately Android and iOS. And now, funny enough, I got a call from Sony who asked us, like, why aren't you making any games for the PlayStation? This was half a year ago. And I said, like, well, it's because you have been very, it's been a very um, closed system to work with. So we had a meeting, and they assured me that the new PlayStation is going to be more open. And to me, that's the best thing that can ever happen. Like, if Xbox and PlayStation are just as open as Steam are with the PC, now I know they have green light on there as well. So they're not as open as they used to be because there's more content in the market. But then I see no reason why niche game companies shouldn't develop for consoles. But let's wait for the console releases and see what happens, because I'm very curious to see. I think they learned a lot from how Valve is doing with Steam, because they're doing tremendously well. The most important factor, though, is get your game released. I don't know how many people have worked on different console niche games and had the assurance from the console manufacturer, this is going out on the console, this is going to be such a great title, and nothing happens. And even if your development cycle was paid for, it's still bad for you because you can't have it in your track record. You need more games under your belt. Learn more. And a release is always a hassle. You, you guys all know that. And we need as many releases as we can to gain more experience points to go up to the next level. Right? So my conclusions today, the final one there is, is my, my punchline, I think. First of all, invite and communicate with your target audience. Keep them close to you. Ask what they want to do. See if they can help you. Our modders at the Paradox Forums are the best friends we ever had. Replayability is a key factor to people coming back to your game and also buying new things for your game once you release new content. Be bold in your marketing. Use the anti-marketing strategy to reach new gamers. Tell people, maybe you can't play this game. Maybe it's too hard for you. Do that. At least try it. The worst thing that can happen is that no one listens. And it's like being home with your kids anyway, right? So I recognize that feeling every day. But something we also discuss is we think that all games has an inner Dota. And what we mean by that is that Dota is originally a mod of Warcraft 3. And it grew to be much more popular and the definition almost of esports in the world. And it was made by a mod team and not by the original Blizzard team. And that is really an interesting experiment because there are so many modders and talented people who play our games who can see new visions and see new ideas in our games that we never thought of. So we need to be open with their ideas and say, you know what, that's a great idea. And then we have to be generous towards these people and actually give them something back so they still are our friends. Maybe we can release games together, do some co-publishing things. I don't know. We actually have a mod team who's making a game for us now called East versus West, which is a strategy game in the Cold War based on the Hearts of Iron series. And it start, started out as a really cool mod for that game. So the inner Dota of the games, I think all games has it. Maybe with the exception for point-and-click adventures. They're really hard to mod. And after that, I mean, we conquer the world. How hard can it be? <laughs> Any questions on that? <laughs> well done. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for that insight into uh, not only surviving, but thriving in, in, in the niche. Um, we're going to have just one question, if there is one, before we break, so that we can be back for uh, Will Wright. Ooh. Thanks very much. That was a great talk. A um, question about your community sort of management. You're saying it's important to speak to your players, and, uh, and of course it is. How do you balance... That, that conversation and sort of getting value from that communication without setting up unrealistic expectations with, the, with that audience uh, about what you, can, what you can really act on in practice? That is such a good question. Thank you Thank very you. much no, for asking welcome. it. And that is also one of the reasons we have not engaged in any Kickstarter so far. Uh, because 
setting up a game like with all the specs, everyone who develops games knows that the initial things that you write for the game will never be the final game once it's out on the shelves, right? So you do so many changes and iterations on the game. But it's very important to play the expectation game with your customers and also to tell them who's actually in charge. I mean, we have to say that we love you guys, you're a great input to us, you have a lot of experience, but we finally make the calls on what's happening in the game and not. And it took us a few years and it takes us, we have very strict foreign policies like no cursing, not even internet language, like shortenings. You get, you get infractions for doing that. Mm -hmm. So we're like, we're like a school in the 19th century. <laughs> like you have to spell things correctly and be nice. We're like a Victorian, uh, I don't know, secondary school. So that's how we handle it, actually. Cool. Lovely. Well, thanks so much, Frederick. That was really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, have a round of applause again.